give a warm welcome to Stefan Einhorn. Thank you for that spontaneous applaud. <laughs> I will start off by telling you about the meeting I had last year with a man who had lost his wife to cancer two years earlier. She had uh, passed away on one of the wards at the Karolinska Hospital. And he said to me, you know, when my wife died, I became so depressed, so I decided to end my own life. But, do you know what made me change my mind? A week after my wife's death, a nurse calls me up from the ward just to ask how I was doing. Can you imagine that? She had so much to do, and she took several minutes of her time to talk to a bereaved husband. That act of kindness made me change my mind, made me want to live. And that's a decision I've never regretted. So what does this story tell us? Well, it tells us that we have huge powers over our fellow human beings' lives. And with power comes responsibility. And this we will talk about today for the next half an hour. And I would like to use my time in the following way. First by asking the question, why should we be kind? Then if we do agree that we should be kind, how do you do it? And then I will uh, float into wisdom, who's intercon which is interconnected with kindness. And if there is time at the end, we'll have a small training session where you can train to be a wise person. <laughs> that, that is how I'd like to use my time. Does this sound OK with you? Yes. Or would you rather have me talk on a completely different subject? <laughs> no. Okay, so I've been introduced to you, but you haven't been introduced to me. So I'd like to start off by getting to know you and by asking the question, which prominent characteristic would you like to have? You can choose between five traits, but you can only pick one. And the first one is a skilled professional to be really good at your work. Or you can also choose to be wealthy and when I say wealthy, I mean stinking rich. <laughs> then you have a few hundred million dollars at your bank account. Or you can choose to be intelligent, so smart, that you are close to a Nobel Prize. Or you can choose to be funny, so funny that when people see you, they laugh so hard <laughs> that they fall off their chairs. <laughs> or you can choose to be a really good human being. Now, I'm very sorry that you can only pick one of these, <laughs> but that's the deal. Have you decided? Yes. OK, so we'll do it by raising our hands. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we want to get to know each other, right? <laughs> and who wants to be a skilled professional? Well, that's not very many people in the audience who appreciate their work. Wealthy, oh, there are only five honest people in the group. <laughs> intelligent, well, that's uh, 19 people want to be intelligent. And who wants to be funny? Okay, so after my lecture, you can gather outside and <laughs> crack a few jokes. Eight people. And who wants to be a really good human being? Please raise your hands. Wow, 311 of you. <laughs> And what can you conclude from this? Well, that no matter what people say about mankind being evil, when you ask this question, a lot of people prioritize being good. And let's keep that in mind when we continue and ask the question, why should we be good? 
And there are plenty of reasons. I don't have to get time to get into all of them. But one major reason is for our own sake, because we benefit from being good. And that's been shown in numerous scientific studies. Here's just one example. They had people play a game. And in this game, you can only choose between two strategies. You can either be generous and cooperate with the other players, or you are egoistic and think only about yourself. Then they did magnetic resonance imaging of the brains in people who were playing this game. And it was shown that if people were generous and collaborated, a pleasure center in the mesolimbic system of the brain became activated, which shows you that you really derive pleasure from cooperating and being generous. That gives us a kick. And it's the same pleasure center that becomes activated by narcotic drugs. And that's good news, right? <laughs> we can skip the heroin <laughs> and instead collaborate. It's the same pleasure and no side effects. It's actually the same pleasure center that becomes activated by good food and sex. So we can skip that too. <laughs> Here's another study. Can a cookie make a difference? In an American university library, they went to the students and gave half of them a cookie. So half got a cookie, and half got no cookie. And then 10 minutes later, they sent up another student to ask for help. And then it turns out those that had gotten a cookie, they helped their fellow students much more frequently than those that didn't get the cookie. And what does this tell you? Well, it tells you that if you do good deeds to others, there is a bigger chance that they will do good deeds to you. And not only to you, but also to other people, which shows you that good deeds spread like waves. Now, I can go on for hours giving you more scientific studies, but there is not enough time. So let's agree that you gain from being kind, and how do you do it then? Well, there is a misunderstanding that kindness is closely connected to being a wimp and being slightly stupid. And there's also this cow that comes up all the time. But this is not being kind. This is something else. This is false kindness. Kind is defined as a will to do good, which is expressed in action. There's not enough, it's not enough to sit and think good thoughts. You have to act. It requires sometimes courage and integrity because sometimes you have to take tough decisions, impopular decisions, and then you take them if they are the best decisions. And you, it's very difficult to be kind if you're dumb. What you need is good judgment or wisdom because a number of the problems you face don't have easy or simple solutions. So we're, all, we're at wisdom, strangely enough. And this is, wisdom is something that we, almost everyone wants to achieve. But it seems not so easy. But it's not that difficult, actually. Because what is wisdom? Wisdom is problem solving. If you're good at solving problems, you are wise. Complex problems. What are you if you're bad at solving problems? Well, you're dumb. <laughs> now, how often do we face a problem? How often do we encounter a dilemma? How often do we come into a situation where the, our reaction is not obvious? Is it once a year? In this audience, it's once a year. <laughs> no? Every day. 
Now we're getting somewhere. It's many times every day. And the problem is that we're not aware always of the fact that we are faced with a dilemma that we have to, to solve. Should you hold up the door for the person coming behind you? Everyone who thinks so, please raise your hands. Also, if that person comes four meters behind you, now you're not so sure. Eight meters. <laughs> exactly how many meters do you want that person to be behind you to hold up the door? And what do you do when you see that the person who is holding up the door 7.8 meters in front of you? You start to run. You stumble on your own feet. You fall on the door and knock out every tooth in the mouth. Do you think that person holding up the door will say, yes, the first d good deed of the day? <laughs> Every time you meet someone, you have to take a decision. Should I say hello or should I look into the, uh, in, into the ground? Should I say hello and also ask how that person is doing? Should I ask how that person is doing and also give me myself the time to listen to the answer? There's no way you can get around it. You have to deal with problems every day, and for that you need wisdom. Now, who might this be? Well, I will tell you, this is my grandfather, Pinchas, my uncle, Roman, my father, Jerzy, and my grandmother, Sarah. And this family, was in Częstochowa in Poland during the Second World War. And it soon became obvious that the Nazis were pli planning to kill all the Jews. And my grandmother said to my grandfather, let's, let's solve this by sending Roman away. He was 11 years at that time. Then at least one from our family will survive. Let's send him to a non-Jewish family and they will take outside the ghetto, and they will take care of him, and we will pay them. My grandfather said, well, how can you trust that family? Maybe they will take the money and hand him over to the Nazis. But my grandmother convinced him. And then came the day when Roman was leaving them. He stood in the hall, on his right side was a bag with his belongings. On his left side was the woman from the family that would hide him for money. But my grandfather, who was a tailor, he sat in this tailor shop working. And finally, my grandmother goes to him and says, aren't you going to say goodbye to your son? You might never see him again. And my grandfather goes out into the hall, but he doesn't go to Roman. He goes to the woman and takes her hand. And he says to her, we give you responsibility for the most cherished thing we have, our own son. But I will ask you to do me a favor. Here is the bag with its belongings. Here is the money for you to hide him. Now please go out of the house and take a small walk by yourself and think about if you want to take on this responsibility and then come back and tell us your decision. The woman promised. She took the bag. She took the money. She left the house. and she never came back. And Roman stayed with his family and survived the war. And thus, yeah, give him a hand. My grandfather Pinchas, he was a wise man. And uh, this is an example of creativity that you need sometimes in order to be wise. Are you creative? Are you create? Oh, you don't know. <laughs> well, we will test you. Now I'll give you a problem. I want you to be creative. I want you to think outside the box. 
I want you to think freely, okay? And here is the problem. You drive your car through a stormy night and pass by a bus stop in the wilderness. There are three persons waiting for the bus. It's an old lady that looks really sick. It's an old friend that once saved your life. And then it's the partner you've always dreamt about. <laughs> You drive your Lamborghini. <laughs> There's only room for one person. Who goes? And everyone who brings the old lady, please raise your hands. I, raise your hands so I can see them. 104 of you. The old friend. Wow. 114. And the dream partner. How many honest people in the audience? 37. Have you been creative? I don't think so. You give the car keys to your friend who drives the old lady to the hospital while you stay behind with your dream partner. Not so easy to be creative all the time. Now another trait which is important for wisdom is understanding people. Because most of the dilemmas we're faced with deals with human-human interactions. And in order to understand people, you need empathy. Because empathy is understanding how another person thinks and feels. And the biggest mistake we make when it comes to empathy is that we believe that everyone thinks like me. And that's not the case. Look at this study. This is an English study in which healthy people, nurses, doctors, and patients with cancer were asked the same question. They were asked, if you are to accept an intensive chemotherapy treatment for a severe malignant disease, what do you require the chances for cure to be? And the healthy people said, it, as a mean, it should be at least 50%, otherwise I'll skip treatment. And the nurses said the same thing. The doctor said, if there is less than 25% chance of a cure, I will not take the treatment. And what do you think the patients with cancer said? Well, they said it's enough with 1%. And this shows you two things. The first one is hope never leaves you. And the second thing is we think differently in different uh, paths of our lives. Because the patients have once been healthy and said, if I get cancer, there, there should be a 50% chance for cure. Otherwise, I'll skip treatment. But they don't say that when they're here then they take uh, their every chance. And if nurses and doctors would treat their patients according to the golden rule, that in Christianity is, you say, so whatever you wish that others would do to you, you, do also to them, they would perform poorly. So. I'm giving you a, a suggestion for a golden rule 2.0, which states that thou shalt strive to treat others as they are in need to be treated, as they are in need to be treated. And for that, you either have to ask people how they want to be treated, or you have to use your empathic skills. Now, one more area of wisdom we will touch upon is dealing with conflicts, because a lot of people in this room have uh, experienced uh, conflicts, and conflicts are always destructive. And I'm not talking about discussions, debates, uh, different opinions. That's very good. I talk about conflicts when you get a new enemy. That's always destructive. So how do you deal with the problem? Well, 
This is my son, Michael, when he was three years old. I'm sure we're all agreed that he's extremely good looking. <laughs> and Michael, he taught me something uh, at this age because he and his brother, they had quarreled, they had screamed, they had been fighting for a whole afternoon when my wife and I got a very good idea to teach them a lesson. So we said to them, you may not watch television, you stupid children. You go to bed immediately. And they were crying and screaming, but we couldn't care less. <laughs> because we were teaching them a lesson. And eventually we had them in their beds and we went into the living room very happy with ourselves. And I can assure you, we were sitting there for at least 30 seconds <laughs> until the door opens and in comes Michael's older brother. He takes three steps into the room, he opens his mouth and says, you are stupid. <laughs> and we said, of course, go to bed, child. So he wanders off and he meets his little brother at the door. Can you tell he's smaller? <laughs> Michael takes three steps into the room, opens his mouth and says, I love you. <laughs> we stopped teaching our children a lesson. <laughs> they got to watch the television and what did this three-year-old child know that uh, many grown-ups don't realize? Well, he understood that the best way to meet with aggressions is not aggressions back, but with kindness, respect. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Tolerance, and why not a little bit of love? Okay, so, if it's so good to be kind and wise, why aren't we always? And the reason is there are counterforces. There are dark sides in us that makes us take poor decisions. And I will give you an example of a counterforce, namely, an, namely fear. Fear makes us take crappy decisions. Fear is a defense mechanism that has run amok and has increasingly with our time become irrational. We fear the wrong things. In a study it was asked, what are you most afraid of? And on third place came fear of sickness and death. But in second place came fear on conflict. And do you know what we fear the most? To speak in front of an audience. <laughs> we would rather die. <laughs> now, as Sabina told you, I've been uh, digging into our dark sides. And you know the old cardinal sins that was compiled by Gregorius I, the year 600. And by doing polls, including 1,200 Swedes, I asked the question, what, are, what do we regard as our worst sides today? And I'll give you the list. In seventh place came greed, so that's something we, we, time has no influence. We don't like greed. Then comes xenophobia. We don't like xenophobia. Narrow-mindedness, bullying, recklessness, hatred, and the worst, according to the Swedish population, the worst trait is deceit or being false. But isn't it strange because uh, how often do you lie? Do you know how often do you lie? You want me to tell you? 
Okay, on an average, you lie eight times a day. And we still despise deceit. Oh, you don't believe me? These are the three most common, these are the three most common lies. Thank you, I'm well. <laughs> I didn't hear the phone. And uh, nice to see you. <laughs> now you believe me. But we do can, we do change. We do have the capacity for change. We don't have to carry around traits that we despise and that our friends and uh, allies despise. But in order for us to change, we have to become aware that we are carrying correct traits that we don't like. If we don't, if we don't realize that we have them, there's nothing we can do about them. Then we have to take the decision if we want to change. And everyone doesn't want to change. Perhaps some people want to be xenophobic and greedy. And if we decide to change, we must be prepared to do the actual work. And that takes a while. But it's worth it, I can assure you. Now, I have only two minutes left of my time, and I will give you a piece of advice. And that piece of advice is be a good example. Because we can't simply tell people to be good or to be wise. Because people will not always do what we tell them to do, but they will do like we do. Do you know how children learn how to walk and talk? Do you think they attend secret night classes? <laughs> nope. They learn from imitating. And the interesting thing is we're still imitating. And that, what does that mean? That means that other people are looking at you and they do like you do. Children, grown-ups will imitate you. And that's the reason why we can't just talk. We have to act as a good example. We'll do a small exercise if everyone will raise up. Please stand up. Now, I want you to do exactly as I say, okay? Please spread your legs a little apart. And then you go up and down a few times. And then relax, stand firmly on the ground. Please raise your right hand. Form an O with your thumb and index finger. And then slowly lower the hand and put it on the lip and then look at each other. Do you not know where the lip is located? <laughs> uh, this is a disgrace. <laughs> but I will give you one more chance, okay? This is where the lip is. Can you count to three? Can you count to three? Yes. Let me hear it. One, two, three. Okay, do as I say this time. Raise your right hand, palm up. Raise your left hand, palm down. Now we'll count to three. When I count to three, you clap your hands. One, two, three. Please sit down. You're terrible. It works every time. 20% will do what I say, although I've told you that you should do all of you should do what I say. 80% will do like I do. And that's because we're biologically primed to imitate. But you don't have to be, feel stupid, okay? I have a colleague at the publishing company. She has seen me lecture seven times and every time. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>